Hello and welcome to the Ashanti Financial Training Industry Analysis Pack on the Premium Chain's OCS Pre-Scene. This video will cover the key flashpoints on the rail industry to give you the best contextual information that you can get for your OCS exam. So let's move on to a quick look at the brief history and the background and introduction of the industry itself. So the first thing we note is that it's actually a very large industry. Between the years 2013 and 2015, it had a market volume of almost 160 billion euros. But how did it get to this size and can it move forward at this size? So the early history dates back all the way to 6 BC in Greece, but this is not what we're interested in. The first real train as we know it and rail transport is with the advent of steam locomotion. So steam engines had a very troubled history in the sense that it was developed in 1712 but it wasn't until 1811 when the first practical railway locomotive was constructed. And following this we have the first intercity railway in 1830. So this is the key sort of background information to the very, very early history of the industry. But prominently, after World War II, the proliferation of motorways and the popularity of air travel saw a massive decline in rail transport as we know it. So from going from a large proportion to a very, very small size in the transport industry at large. But the advent of high-speed rail in the 1960s and the emergence of megacities in 2000 onwards and a larger and larger increasing uh, population has meant that the train industry and rail transport as we know it today to flourish to grow back to where it was to when steam propulsion was the primary source of locomotion. Partnered with this is actually the greater awareness that people have of the environmental impact due to trains having a very very small proportion of emissions compared to other transport modes this has also aided the resurgence. But how does this apply to the pre -scene? Well, very briefly, the industry is almost 10 times as old as premium trains is as a company. Premium trains only gained their contract and franchisee ship from the government of Torland 25 years ago. This means that they probably inherited an old fleet of trains and they're probably in the process of deciding how they're going to upgrade these features. So what kind of trains are there? Well, very briefly, the most important one, just as a key flashpoint, is the Hitachi Class 800. It's being rolled out on many rail networks across the world, particularly Western Europe, and this summer it's coming to the UK. It has high-speed capabilities, and it is a hybrid electric diesel with the option of full electric operation. So the environmentally friendly aspect is definitely there. But Rail providers don't sell trains, they sell tickets. So what kind of tickets do they have? Well, as an industry at large, there are first class tickets at a higher price point with luxury features such as lounges and more leg room. Then there are the more basic tickets that are called standard class. They're a lower price point, but things like Wi-Fi and leg room are not a given. Then there are advanced tickets. These are tickets that are sold really far in advance as you might expect customers can pay for them months and months in advance to get a cheaper price but it's for a very specific journey they often have a very very low price to suit the earlier you book them and they sort of increase incrementally as more people pre-purchase their tickets then you have off-peak tickets which is a time restricted ticket often avoiding the rush hour for example in london after 11 20 a.m that's when off-peak begins and this typically gives you about a 10 to 20 percent uh, discount on the ticket price. Then you have anytime tickets. These are just completely flexible tickets. They cost the full price that you would expect. And these favor the people that just need to get from A to B no matter what. So business professionals is one of the best examples of this. Rail cars. So this is an often government linked aspect in terms of products. So we know that Premium trains don't have a rail car system, or at least it's not mentioned, but this is primarily 
to do with the Tallinn government as it's a subsidy in most cases. For example, in the UK, the elderly, young and disabled get a 10% discount on all ticket fares once they have acquired a rail card. And finally, we have season ticket. A season ticket is a very long period ranging from a week to a year of a given route return ticket any time, any day between those, that period, the preset period. And this gives you a substantial discount. For example, a seven day ticket from two London stations averages at about £4.73. And then if you do it for a year, it's actually £3.94. So you always get a discount and the longer you purchase the ticket for, in terms of time period, you get a cheap price. But let's move forward. So research and development. So what's the industry like in this area? Well, to be short, the industry standard is actually constant improvement, rolling stock improvements, platform improvements. It's a major agenda for Crossrail and Transport for London, for example. And in terms of rolling stock improvements, as I've mentioned, the Hitachi Class 800 is rolling out in, in loads and loads of rail companies, particularly in the UK this summer of 2017. So this is a quick rundown of the conceptual design of the Hitachi that we've been mentioning. So let's have a look at competitors. Competitors is a tough one when it comes to the rail industry because in part, it's not that competitive. Because it's a privatization or nationalized service, i.e. it used to be nationalized and national rather, and it has been privatized, the contract bidding system where it's just one company on a set line after winning the contract means that there's very little competition between companies outside of those bidding windows. So we have railways by co railway companies by market value and annual revenue, and you can see a very stark difference between this. Uh, particularly, the annual revenue is higher in the nationalized rail companies, whereas the market value is actually higher in the privatized companies. So how does this all apply to premium trains? Well, in terms of types of trains, we just know from the pre-scene that it's, they're not high-speed trains. 100 miles an hour doesn't qualify. 125 plus is the high-speed requirement. And they're generally just commuter trains. In terms of competitors, as, as I mentioned, the nature of railway operators makes it difficult to make any sort of key applications to the pre-scene. However, you can extrapolate that there would be uh, there are other Torland operators who will likely bid on premium changes contract once it's up for renewal in a couple of years. Now, ticket products is the big one. When you look at the pre-scene, they don't offer return tickets. And you might be thinking, that's very odd. Well, you were right. This is a massive bullseye saying this question topic is going to come up. So the lack of returns is odd in itself, but then you also have a lack of advanced tickets, a lack of off-peak tickets, which means that they're not actually catering to these more economical options. And this is definitely going to be a key topic moving forward in terms of pricing strategy. So what about research and development? Well, we haven't been told in the pre-scene whether premium trains plan on upgrading their entire fleet. But we can see that it's an increasing trend across the industry already. So you, we can assume that it should be high on the agenda. So whilst there's also the pricing strategy of tickets, premium trains will often, or likely rather, have to look at investing, reinvesting their capital in improving their services on the whole. So let's now look at customers and who buys what tickets. So first, who goes on trains in general? Well, in terms of age, it appears to be with the working age range. And whilst there are differences between people who went from miles spent, or rather the metric being miles spent traveling versus trips per year, there are def there's definitely a correlation between working age and the usage of trains. So this would suggest that commuters and business traveling is actually the largest proportion of travel on the rail. When we look at gender, however, there is a noticeable gap on overground rail usage in terms of average. However, women 
between the ages of 21 and 29 actually average the highest. Therefore, in general, we can definitely see that gender is of much smaller impact, perhaps insignificant impact, on the customers compared to age. As you can see from the graph here, how the different age groups work with genders. So now, who buys what ticket? Well, you can break down travel categories into three key types, leisure, business, and commuting. So commuters at large want the flexible tickets. From what we can see here, as I scroll down, anytime, anytime day single and return tickets have a very high proportion of commuters. And likewise, business travelers are also quite keen on this type of ticket too, with leisure being the smallest proportion of them. As we change the different ticket types, we can see differing trends, but the key take home points is actually that leisure travelers favor these cheaper tickets. The proportion on advanced tickets and off-peak tickets is far larger when it comes to leisure travel. So from this, we can get the premium trains with their current ticket pricing strategy are not catering to, to people who want to travel for leisure. So what do passengers want from their service? Well, they want the value for money. And as we've already noted, a lack of return tickets is weird, right? There's no return tickets. Two singles always cost more than the return. Returns are the epitome of value for money. So we can kind of get from this that one of the passenger priorities is just not catered for. Once again, an area for improvement. Likewise, passengers always want a seat. We don't really know too much about the crowding situation. They also want trains to be sufficiently frequent. However, it looks like premium trains just about cover frequency. It's one every hour or so. It could probably be better, but it's not the worst. Trains being on time, premium trains seem to have a relatively strong uh, performance in terms of tardiness. And also they wish information about delays to be swift and clear. This is something we can't really glean anything from, from the pre-scene. However, we do know that generally speaking, leisure passengers are the most satisfied out of all categories. But when we consider that their ticket, their pre uh, preferred tickets are not actually offered by premium trains, we in fact will cast doubt on this. Leisure, 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 leisure passengers for premium trains are likely to be quite dissatisfied because the value for money aspect for their less busy traveling needs are not met. So as I've mentioned, the applica as I've mentioned, the application to the pre-scene is that the demographics show that working ages are actually the largest portion of people that use rail travel. And when we look at who buys what tickets, we can see that premium trains are not catering very well for their differing customer base, particularly those who are seeking to travel for leisure. And in terms of passenger priorities, value for money is a pretty difficult one to correspond to premium trains' current pricing strategy. It doesn't really add up. Two single fares is not going to be value for money for passengers. So this is going to be a key customer complaint if it were to be an exam question.